This is the first of a series of videos about the road to revolution, the American Revolution. This one goes into the French and Indian War and the Proclamation of 1763. So these are the essential things you need to know for this one. Uh, by the end you should be able to do this, explain the causes of the French and Indian War. We've got four of them here including George Washington, sort of. You'll learn about how Indian tribes uh, helped the French, why some of them helped the French and some helped the English, so Indians were on both sides of this war. Uh, we'll show you where the land that England won from France in this war. And the Proclamation of 1763, you'll learn the causes and effects of that. So. Uh, beginning with some of the causes of the war, I'm not going to read every word here. Um, you can see where the, the colonies were, and uh, here we go. So, again, the, the red shows where the English were, and this color, this orangish color, uh, showing you what the French had claimed. Um, and this had all happened in, back in the 1500s or so. Uh, this, where the arrow is right now, that's the Ohio River, uh, which forms part of the border of the state of Ohio now, and that comes into our story quite a bit. Uh, and this is the area where some of those backcountry settlers, again, where the arrow is, that area where those backcountry settlers had been, and now you can see that they were actually in French territory, and that becomes a big deal in this, this story. So another cause of the war besides territory is trade. Mercantilism comes back uh, into the story here. Uh, here we're talking about the fur trade. So in this story, uh, most of the battle is not over trade along the Atlantic Ocean, where the arrow is here, where we were focusing on previously, uh, but furs. And furs were so valuable because, unlike the kinds of clothes that can get grown, like uh, cotton or even wool from sheep, furs were the best form of winter weather clothing. Uh, waterproof to keep off snow and rain, and everybody wanted some of those furs from animals in this part of the world. So, trade in tribes. The Native Americans who were living near those mountains for many decades were trading furs with the French and trading furs with the British for European goods. There were alliances between certain trades, uh, certain tribes, and either with the British or with the French. So, some were loyal to France and some were loyal to Britain, specifically the Iroquois. Uh, the Iroquois tribes tended to be with the British, and the Huron tribes tended to be with the French. And there were other tribes in, in the middle as, as well. But over time, there were more and more traders from England, more and more traders from France, and there's more and more competition. So this happy story does not get to stay that way for long. Uh, and I'm just, we'll just briefly show you about religion, uh, how these countries have been fighting each other for a long, long time. Uh, so when we get to the French and Indian War, and if you're interested, you could pause and read some more of this. So, territory and trade, again. Here's another map showing you what things looked like here, and the area that's going to be disputed. We call this that backcountry area. So by the 1750s, the population in the colonies, those 13 colonies, is swelling really rapidly, especially Virginia and those middle colonies. Uh, we focused on that earlier as well. So British fur traders start moving their business into this Ohio River Valley. There are more colonists trying to come to that back country. And remember, there are some Scots-Irish already there who don't really want to share their land, so they force those settlers even a little bit further west. Which would be fine, except the French believe this was their land. And they felt these English traders, these English settlers, are threatening their fur trade. So the French start building forts, little forts along, especially along the Ohio River, so they can defend their land. And in 1754, this built up to the point that war broke out between France and Great Britain, and this will last for quite a while. So a little more about how this war started. You may know this guy, George Washington. This is a very young George Washington in British Army uniform, 
And the first battle of the war was fought, and actually lost, by this guy who was unknown. He was from a, a middle-class family, not really rich, and not known at all. He'd been ordered by the governor of Virginia to take a few hundred men and capture one of those French forts, uh, which was in the back country. But Virginia was hoping to be able to claim that land for itself and expand Virginia. So that was the plan. And Washington, or one of his men, fired the very first shots at that fort, Fort Duquesne is how you say that. Uh, he lost the battle, but in the war he did gain a strong reputation, and he learned a lot about the strategies that work for fighting battles in this kind of territory. And in the 1750s, he's kind of a loser in battle, but by the 1770s, he'll, of course, become a very well-known and very successful military general. Uh, so this is just showing you where some of more of the battles occurred. There's Fort Duquesne, where uh, our friend George Washington originally lost. Uh, lots of other battles around here. We're not going to go into all of those. Uh, this also shows how worldwide this war was. There were some battles being fought in India. There were battles being fought in Europe, in the middle of Europe, uh, over this. Anywhere you see shaded uh, even in the oceans, yes, you had ships battling with each other. Uh, you have the Spanish Empire hoping maybe they can gain something from this. Spain joins in after a while, see if they can get maybe some of Georgia or South Carolina. So this is a worldwide war. Again, we're not going into the details of it, um, so let's just jump to the results. Uh, well, there's one major battle at Quebec, Quebec City, um, midpoint of the war. And that's really the turning point. Uh, they continue to win battles, and by 1763, France finally has to surrender. Uh, a treaty was signed in Paris, and Britain gets a lot of land. So again, this is that map at the beginning. Look at all that blue for France, all that land they were arguing about. And look at all the red by the end. There's no blue left here. Look how much France lost. Uh, Spain actually gained some. Uh, which is, again, a part of the story we're not really going to get into right now, but the Mississippi River is that dividing line, and the only thing France got to keep was one little island way offshore over here, uh, Haiti. But, before everyone's cheering too much, victory brings problems, problems for the English. So, again, those two causes of the war. Why did it start in the first place? One, of course, was territory. British settlers trying to get land and get to trade. So after winning the war, of course, British people here in North America expect they can move into those areas. The backcountry settlers expect they can help, they can stay because of all the help they did. But remember, the Native American tribes had been involved. And now you've got two angry groups. You've got the tribes who were on the French side and of course, they're still mad with the English, so they, even though the war is technically over, they keep attacking forts along the Ohio River. And wait, it's even worse, because some of those tribes who had been on the English side are getting treated really, really badly. They're not getting the support that they thought they were going to get from the British. A lot of trust gets lost. Uh, a lot of really nasty stories, actually, that we may get into during class. So... You know, you got tribes on the French side really bitter with the English. We've got tribes on one side expecting to get lots of help, and they just get shoved off what both sides think is their land. So it looks like we're heading into a long war against Indian tribes, but King George, King George III of England, has a plan to prevent that. So here we get to the Proclamation of 1763. So he makes a royal proclamation. Fancy word for a big announcement. So he's going to organize those vast tracts of land that had been won in the war. And a boundary line gets drawn among the highest points of the Appalachian Mountains. We'll see that in a second. And it declared colonists cannot move west of that line. So how does that solve things? Well, the native tribes on both sides, they're delighted. They have a wide so-called Indian reserve. So they stop fighting English soldiers. And actually, even some tribes who had been on the French side end up budding up with, with England. To them, this is great. Uh, you got some very angry colonists 
because they believed they had the right to settle on that land. And what about those backcountry settlers? So what, they have to move off that land now? And <laughs> who's even going to make them? So we've reached the end of... I'll just go back here to show you the line. Uh, it's basically this line right here. That proclamation line is basically right about that line that we had before on our maps. Uh, it's this point going right between what we call the backcountry and those the western borders of those colonies. So the proclamation line is organizing all this extra land here. So we have a proclamation line going along about this way. See there's that fall line, all the rivers flowing this way, and all the other rivers flowing west that way, so it's this line right here. And all this land, for now, would be for those Native Americans. So that concludes this uh, video. As usual, you can go back and see something again that you might have missed. Uh, so I will stop recording now.